Hey everyone, welcome back to the Artist Says Coming. Today we are talking about the new legendary lord for the Empire coming with Thrones of Decay, which is Elspeth von Draken. And I think that this is a very interesting campaign to say the least. I think that it's getting a little bit overshadowed as far as public perception is concerned uh, when you're talking about its comparison to the stuff coming for the dwarves and Nurgle, but this one is definitely different, and that's what I want to spend today's video on. And of course, review will be coming on this after uh, the embargoes drop today. We are just talking about the particulars of the campaign. I've made it to about turn 30 something, and I think that I've unlocked the majority of the content uh, so I can show you sort of how it all works. So first off, if we look at her, she is a death caster. So she has a strong death casting line here. It's a single lore of magic casting line. And I've been a little bit uh, critical of casting death magic up to this point, but I think that she makes it work because uh, she has this full death line, but then she also has some serious reductions here to the cost of death casting. So minus 15% for lore of death spells and plus 10 for her reserve capacity. And then at the end of the line, we get the uh, purple sun of Zarius for minus six. And of course, minus nine for the upgraded version, uh, allowing her to spam this considerably more than you would be at any point in any campaign, really. If we look at the rest of her line, she is, uh, she's got a battle healing cap, minus 25% for enemy armies in the region. This is really important because you are going to be going up against the vampire counts. We'll talk about that a little bit more here in a second. Uh, she also has the advisor of Nuln, which is uh, recruitment costs for gunnery units, uh, she also gets extra for, uh, recruit capacity for engineers and upkeep for gunnery units reduced. So you can tell she's definitely going for the gunnery school, which is definitely themed in her uh, campaign mechanics. I'll get to that here in a second. She is also a very squishy lord, as in she should never be in melee combat. But she does have this ability, so if she gets stuck in melee combat incidentally, you can pop this and for 30 seconds she gets 40% physical resistance. So there is a little bit of a balance there. Keep her out of combat for sure. And then, of course, she also gets uh, wound recovery time and regeneration. Her mounts, she gets the Barred Warhorse and then the Carmine Dragon, which this Carmine Dragon is hardcore. Okay, that's all I have to say is this thing is nuts. So this is definitely a very strong improvement to her character overall. She becomes much more viable once she gets on that Carmine Dragon. Uh, before that, you need to baby her a little bit. She also gets some special uh, excuse me, items here at the top. So the Frostbite Gem, Flaming Attacks or Frostbite Attacks. I'll show you some B-roll of how that works. You apply this to somebody in your army. You also get the Everwood Root, which gives you a regeneration for that character. And then the Doomfire Ring, which is Burning Head. It also gives 25% uh, fire resistance. So you can apply that, again, to characters within the army, including Elspeth herself. Standard blue line, standard red line, as you would expect, and then, you know, all the other stuff that you would find up here for an Empire character. Items. The Pale Scythe. So, melee defense, melee attack. Winds of Magic cost, further reduction for Lore of Death spells. Mist, Bass, Mist Cast Chance and uh, the Pale Scythe ability. The Death's Timekeeper. Winds of Magic Power Reserve, plus three per turn. You get the Death's Timekeeper, which is direct damage ability. The set bonus is Magic Drop Chance and chance of stealing an item 20% at the end of a battle. She starts over here at Nuln, which is the location of the Cannon Foundry as well as the Black Rose Stables right there. We'll get to more of this stuff here in a second when we talk about the faction mechanics, uh, but she also works off of the Imperial Authority system, which you can take this number here, 85 for instance, as 85% of the empire is owned by empire factions. So all of these guys here and yourself own 85% of 
of the Empire. So it's obviously not that high when you start, but you can see that there are some pretty strong debuffs for dropping below uh, what I'm going to call normal, 51 to 75% there, and then some buffs once you start getting up there, right? Now, as far as her individual campaign mechanics are concerned, let's start out with the Imperial Gunnery School. This obviously starts out at Tier 1, and then for each of the tiers, there are various things that you have to do to accomplish that tier to have access to the upgrades. Okay? So, it obviously, start out Tier 1. There are three levels of upgrade that you can see, and each one of these is unlocked. And you do that by spending schematics. Schematics are a little bit hard to find at the beginning. As you progress, some battles will yield you thousands of them. Instead of post-battle casualties or anything like that, it's kills with guns that gets them. And you can see that there are various categories. So this one is for all the gunnery infantry. This is one is for all the gunnery cavalry, then mortars, cannons. You see all the things, right? So this is one side of the Imperial Gunnery School. Let's flip over to the other side, which is the Amethyst Armory. This is her special recruitment mechanic, and you unlock these as far as capacity is concerned by spending schematics. You can see here, if I wanted to add another one, I would purchase another Amethyst unit. So the capacity is governed kind of like the Beastmen where you increase the capacity of those units. You still have to pay for the recruitment though. If you look here, they are also upgradable. So this one has four levels of upgrade and they cost schematics obviously, and they have specific upgrades over here that you can use depending on your level now let's talk about the gardens of more so this mechanic i have only got one garden of more constructed at the moot and you can see it denoted right here by this purple flower and this is a fast travel mechanic among some other things so if we were to say one it to travel to the moot. We would come in here, select the moot, and then this is the fast travel button. This is the cooldown timer stating when you can fast travel to the region and when you can't, and it costs you 2,000. It also costs you 3,000 to build a garden of more. So if we look at the individual settlement here, there's another tab that denotes the garden of more, and we have one build slot inside here in addition to the standard building that is just there, which allows Elspeth to fast travel to this location, is immune to diplomatic penalties from trespassing against region's owner, and enables replenishment in foreign territory. Also, if Elspeth is here, it gives the Garden of more fast travel cost reduction and provides a garrison of two halberdiers. The additional buildings that are available here are as follows, unlocks hero recruitment for the Amethyst Wizard, so that is your hero uh, that is the Deathcaster. Hero capacity plus two for all battle wizards, so you don't have to build that building chain. You can produce these in any region with a limit of five. And they can only be constructed in Empire regions owned by an Imperial faction. Winds of Magic power reserve capacity plus 10 for faction-wide. So every single one of these that you build, you just get an extra 10. And then Winds of Magic power reserve plus 20 per turn for armies in the region. So if you look here, if we were to open her up, she is gaining magic. Let's go back to the other buildings. That's this building. If we look at this one, this is upkeep reduction for all armies in this region and in adjacent regions. And global recruitment costs, uh, excuse me, global recruitment duration minus two for armies in the region. Global recruitment capacity plus one faction wide. Gotcha. Gotcha. And then the last one also provides unlocks recruitment for Knights of More, Elector Count State Troops. And mercenary replenishment time minus 10 for Knights of More Electric Count State Troops. Corruption minus 5 and vigor loss reduction minus 20% when fighting against undead factions. All armies. Which can also play well with her faction effects, which is a research reduction rate. 15% reduction for gunnery units in all armies. Double experience for artillery and gunnery units. And also, if you look at her individual effects her lord effects her 
army is immune to vampiric attrition, which is really important when going up against the vampire counts. So what I would say is that if you are a person that is looking to do a whole lot of gunnery stuff, like you want to do gunpowder spam armies, then uh, this is the faction that gets that done. I mean, you can do that obviously with a whole bunch of the Empire factions, but the specialist would be Elspeth von Draken. That's for sure. And I don't think that's unfair to say. I found myself not even using wizards at all. In fact, if I go back to my campaign, I use the wizards in little bands like this to go around and buff the regions because, quite frankly, we don't really need magic when we have guns that are this big. So anyway, that's my real quick look at Elspeth von Draken and her individual campaign mechanics. Art of Saves coming out of here. Bye.